Okay, so it's now recorded. Like I said, everything is, uh, all courses will be recorded, barring any uh, infrastructural problem on my part. Either way, since uh, I have multiple courses, uh, you have only one in English. So if, uh, if it happens that it's not recorded, there's going to be a Romanian course recorded, which has similar content. Uh, hopefully nothing unexpected happens, so we're not in that case. <clears throat> Radio. Um, so the first thing we want to talk about is the HTTP protocol, which is the fundamental protocol of the web. Uh, now we want we're going to want to clarify a couple of things. So HTTP is hypertext transfer protocol, which tells me it's a text protocol, uh, and we're going to try to, to clarify what we're talking about here. So uh, first of all, I've said earlier, but let me repeat this: What is a protocol? Right. So uh, what we're using right now, for example, is a protocol. It's a communication protocol but it's a really complex communication protocol, the human language. Fortunately, uh, when we're talking about web applications, we're in a much simpler case, but the principles remain the same, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a bunch of messages which I can send for which I have some expected behavior. Um, this protocol is going to be applied between a client and the server. Uh, in this case, the client is going to be the web browser, whilst the server uh, is going to be a web server. We're going to talk about this shortly, um, but this is the idea of a protocol. Now, what about the HTTP protocol? Now, first things first, it's an application level protocol. And since we've not done networks first, let's explain this for a bit. <coughs> so you've, you've, you've not gone through a networks course. Now, when talking about transmitting data in the network, uh, something which has been uh, discovered in, in time, uh, all of this is pretty recent, right? On a grand human scale, all of this, these technology stacks are recent. And what's been discovered is that network communication is really, really complex. Right? So, uh, because I have to talk, on one hand, I have to talk about requesting a resource via, like an HTTP, requesting a, an image, for example. Uh, and on the other hand, if I talk about network communication as a whole, I also have to, to talk about how information gets through a cable, and how, it, how it's encoding, encoded to go through a cable. And these things are so radically different that the solution that was reached was that uh, we, people segmented the communication over the network in different layers. Right? And each layer is abstract. I, I don't care what happens inside it. I just care what it does for me, what services it delivers. Uh, so since we have these layers, for example, if we talk about putting things on a cable, it's uh, we're talking about the physical layer. Now. The, that's the, the lowest kind of layer, but the highest kind of layer is an application protocol, uh, which is something which talks, uh, which, which uses concepts which relate to a particular application. In this case, we're talking about delivering resources over the web. <coughs> now, it's a request response protocol. What that means is that in the way that the protocol was initially imagined, the client makes a request and the server responds to that request in one way or another. And this is the whole of the communication. That's it. That's, that's the communication. Now, obviously, uh, and you're going to see this for the next bullet points here, uh, some of these things are obvious problems. Right? And uh, we, we have to have a way of, of circumventing, let's say, the nature of the protocol. Now, the reason this protocol was so so effective, so uh, adopted on such a large scale, is that it's a little engineering jewel. It, con it contains, it's a really simple protocol, which contains extensibility mechanisms within itself. We'll get back to this, but let's, uh, let's continue with the general characteristics. So it's synchronous communication, which means that uh, typically the client is going to request a resource, and then the client can't do anything but wait for that resource. Right, it's, uh, it can't affect anything until it, the resource is, is, is delivered, and then it can request a new resource. Uh, now, the protocol carries text data. Now, carries text data is, is not as restrictive as it seems, because obviously, if we look at anything, even if we look at this, uh, this Google Drive thing, uh, I, have, I obviously have some, a bunch of images, right, and they were delivered over HTTP. How does that work? Well, uh, this is simpler, like I said, because all that I have to do is encode those images as text, and I can do that with an encoding scheme called Base64 encoding. Communication is initiated only by the client. 
is again as the client makes a request the server doesn't initiate communication now if I think about the problems I'd have with, with this facet of the protocol uh, let's say I have a list of uh, of uh, I don't know a list of products right and one product uh, meanwhile some other users interacted with the server and one product went out of stock I'm not going to know that until I make a new request again this is something we we can circumvent uh, in the modern uh, in the modern web world I can actually have notifications from the server through stuff like web sockets uh, all these limitations are not actually limitations is what I'm getting at then the protocol is stateless which means that each request is independent now this uh, this is an obvious problem from the beginning of uh, it's not something modern it's obvious from the beginning of writing web applications that this is going to be a problem because I can think about the store and I want to buy something I want to buy a pair of shoes and I add them to the cart and then I make a request to go to checkout and if the protocol is stateless when I go to checkout I'm going to forget what happened right I'm not going to know what I had in the cart uh, <coughs> now. Let's uh, let's investigate this a bit uh, also. So first of all, let's look at the first web page. Right. So this is the first web page, and I can actually I can actually look in the network tab here, in the tools which I've opened, and see the request I've done. And this is the request. And let's let's talk about a couple of things. So uh, at its simplest level, uh, the HTTP protocol has a um, a method and the URL. Right? It's a, so we get this particular resource which has this particular address. But the protocol is extensible. What that means is that apart from these I can add a bunch of key value pairs, right? request headers, so accept this stuff, accept encoding this stuff, etc. And here comes the, the extensibility mechanism, so one of the extensibility mechanisms. If I request something with a header which my uh, my the server in this case my the, the other uh, the other part of the conversation does understand we're going to use that header but if they don't understand it they can safely ignore it and I'm just going to have to continue communication without using that header right so it's a uh, if if the server is uh, is dumber in this case because this is one of the first servers if the server server is dumber than I expect. I can just communicate on in its own with its own, its own limitations, and we're still going to be able to exchange information. Maybe not as eff efficiently, but we're still going to be able to talk. In this case, for example, I have a header which says "accept encoding gzip deflate," which is, if I think about this being a text protocol, this means that uh, it would really benefit from compression. Right? Text text really benefits from compression. So what I'm saying to the server is, if you can send my resource zipped, if you can if you compress it, if, if you can compress it, I can decompress it, and this is going to be invisible to the user, right? I, I'm never going to notice if it was compressed or not. Uh, but it's going to, I want to pass as little information over the network as possible. So this is going to mean the, the speed of the connection is going to be better and so forth. Now, in this particular case, the server doesn't know what I'm talking about. So I, I don't find any correspondent uh, header for this except encoding. So they're just going to uh, to answer with the uncompressed resource. But my browser, seeing that they didn't receive a, a corresponding header for GZD, for except encoding GZ deflate, it's just going to, they're not going to try to decompress the response and they're just going to render it. They're just going to draw it in the window. So this is one extensibility mechanism. Uh, to talk about the more advanced extensibility mechanism, uh, you've encountered HTTPS. Now, what's what's interesting about HTTPS is that it's identical to HTTP. Now, if I think about the the layered model, right? I said this is the application layer. Uh, I'm going to need something which actually transmits stuff over the network, right? And in the case of HTTP, the protocol that is lower than HTTP is going to be TCP, <coughs> which is Transmission Control Protocol. Uh, and uh, whenever HTTP wants to send something over the network, it's going to, to forward it to, to the layer with, in which TCP resides, and TCP is going to handle the rest. Now, HTTPS 
has exactly the same commands as HTTP. The only difference being that instead of an insecure transport layer, CP, it actually uses a secure transport layer, which is um, called TLS. And TLS, which is transport layer security, uh, supports connection encryption. Now, let's say I want to have a transport over HTTP. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, to start the conversation over HTTP and then propose to the server uh, to elevate the conversation, to, to transform it into an HTTPS conversation. And if they don't understand what I'm saying, I can continue the conversation over HTTP. But if they do, we're going to switch to HTTPS. Right. Um, no state is maintained between successive requests because the protocol is stateless. Now, this is not exactly true. Uh, obviously, I have to maintain state in some fashion. So if we look at uh, if we look at the first web page, we're not going to see anything. But if we look at the university site and look at the request, you see I have a, a bunch more requests. Uh, if I look at what was requested here, it was just two things. If I look here, it was a bunch of things. Uh, the reason for this was that when I did the request to Acero, this actually looks a bit strange, right? It's a, because it's not a particular resource. It seems to be something else. Well, this is a convention. When, whenever I request the root of a website such as this, what I'm actually requesting is a an index HTML file which is in the root of the website. So, I've re so what I've requested is uh, asset.raw slash index HTML. Now, uh, what I've what I received was this, right? was delivered this thing and the browser wanted just like we talked earlier to draw the thing right? to, to draw it in the window uh, unfortunately when it, it looked at this it saw that it needs some additional resources such as some styles or an image or a font and so forth so in order to draw this particular page it had to do additional requests now um, this is a bit of a tangent, so let's go back to headers and see what happened here. So I can see that the request, uh, the response header from the server, there was a response uh, server, uh, response uh, header, which said set cookie to something. And uh, the cookie is going to be uh, a key value pair, which in turn contains key value pairs. And this is going to be saved on the client. Now, if all the the necessary information to maintain communication state is saved on the client, it's an actual regular cookie. In this case, it's not actually a regular cookie. What's being saved on the client is a key, and this key is going to be transmitted with subsequent requests, and it corresponds to some state which is saved on the server. Right? So it's a, it's a session ID. So I have cookies which are stored on the client and sessions which are stored on the server. So that's how I maintain state. Right, synchronous communication. So uh, as a rule, uh, after making a request, the client waits for a response. Uh, now, waits for a response, this, this has to be, we have to be a bit more subtle about this because uh, it might wait for the response explicitly, so it might be visible to the user or not. Uh, it's going to, if it needs the, resu the result of the process, the, the request, um, it's going to wait for the request one way or another. But it's, it can be invisible to the user, and this ties into our, our single page app uh, model, let's say. Uh, because at some point, uh, the idea came about that what I can do is load some JavaScript code, and then the JavaScript code is going to make the request without the client, in, client noticing anything. And when the request comes back, it's going to modify the page dynamically. And this was called Ajax, um, and this is the, the basis for asynchronous communication over the web. Uh, as an aside, something which I've skipped is that when talking about uh, when talking about state, like cookies and sessions and everything, uh, this actually doesn't apply for for single page apps. Uh, we we can save something in cookies or in local storage or anything like that, uh, but we needn't do that, right? Because since we're in a single page, we can maintain state in just some JavaScript uh, variables. Right? There's not going to be any other page to overwrite any state. Everything is managed by us. Uh, now, the client, like I said, was the browser, and the browser, what the browser does is request something from a server and then draw it in the window, in the browser window. Um, uh, 
uh, web servers, the, the pair, right? It's because I have a client, which is the browser, and then a server, which is the, um, which delivers the resources. The, so the web server can be a really diverse kind of mechanism. Uh, they, they don't necessarily look alike, so to speak. So I have a, a wide variety of web servers, and what I can say about them, what they have in common, is that they deliver web resources, and that's it. Um, if I, for example, web servers encompass stuff like Apache, which is the granddaddy of all web servers, and Apache does a bunch of things. It's, uh, it delivers web resources, but it also runs code in containers, such as PHP, uh, or it does virtual hosting and so forth. Uh, so Apache is one kind of web server, but if I look at something like Nginx, Nginx is something completely different. It's something which is called a reverse proxy. Now, if I think about a, a proxy, a forward proxy, what a forward proxy does is it disguises the existence of multiple clients. Right? So I have multiple clients which don't have visible addresses, and they all make requests through the same computer. And then the server replies to that computer, to that, that gateway, and the gateway distributes the responses. So that's what the proxy does. Now, Nginx does the reverse of this, a reverse proxy, which is it hides the existence of multiple servers. So I, I make requests to a particular uh, to a particular website, and uh, the Nginx, which, which receives these, these requests, distributes them to various computers for, um, for processing, which allows me to do horizontal scaling. Now, if I look at IIS, which is under Windows, that's another different animal. It's actually a web server and an application server and it's HTTP and uh, an FTP server all in one. So it's even stranger. So uh, web servers are, are pretty varied, uh, but what, I, what they all do is they deliver web resources. <laughs> now, our backend is going to be something which can best be described as a custom web server. It's not as complicated as it seems because the fact that we're actually writing a custom web server is going to allow us to, to have a server which only does what we need, nothing more. Now, if what's common between web servers is that they deliver web resources, let's see what web resources are. Right? So, web resources are not necessarily files. They may be files, and in many cases they are files, but they may be something else. If I request an HTML file, what's going to happen is that the server is going to send me that HTML file in some fashion. But if I request a, say, a PHP file, uh, I'm not going to receive the file. Uh, the server is going to do something else. Uh, in this case, it's going to run the PHP file in some fashion. And what, what I'm going to receive in the browser is going to be the result of the execution of that PHP file, right? not the, the file itself. Now, uh, for a second thing, uh, web resources needn't be text. Right? They can be binary, uh, which are encoded as text via Base64, like I said. Uh, now, if they are binary resources, <coughs> I need something else, which is I need the type of the resource, which is defined for something called the MIME type. Now, MIME types are ancient. Right? They existed before the internet. They were used for mail. And they look something like this. Uh, so. This is, uh, for example, if I have an object, a serialized object like we're going to use, it's going to be application JSON. If I have a movie, uh, it's going to be, we don't have any movies. Uh, I can have movies, <laughs> I can have images, uh, etc. Right? And the reason why this exists is that the browser, after it gets the file in its text encoded form, it's going to decode it, and then it's going to have to do something with it. And this do something is going to be different if the file is an image or a video or an object or a serialized object or whatever it is. So this is how I specify the object type. Right, now let's assume that the, the resource is a file. Right, so if it is a file or if it involves a file, the server has to view it in two ways. So on the one hand, when I when I request something like uh, asset.raw slash index.html, on the one hand, there's a remote perspective on this. I, I get the file, I can address the file, I can have an ad some way of, of referring to the file, and thus request it to the server. But the server has to read the file from somewhere. Now, from my browser, I can't actually ascertain 
what the structure of the files on the access server is. And this is a, a security thing, right? If I, I, it would be a huge security risk if I could, from this, I could see the whole structure of the files on, on that server, whatever it is. Uh, so I don't have that local perspective. The server does have to have it though, because if I think about me requesting this HTML file, what the server has to do is open it on the hard drive, read from it, and then send it to the network. So it has to have a local perspective. Now, a local perspective is actually going to mean more or less a path. That's because in order to open the file to read from it, the server is going to need a file descriptor, and it's not going to be able to get the file descriptor without knowing where the file is physically on the hard drive. So I have this remote view of resources and the local view of resources. Now, as for the, the local view of resources, is something which you've seen in various operating systems, it's a path. Now, what about the remote view? Now, the remote view is done via URI. Uh, so it's a uniform resource identifier. Now, this is composed via URL, and typically URL is used uh, in conversation, let's say, instead of a URI, and the URN, right? So it's a location of the resource and the name of the resource. And I can see a bunch of URLs, right, like this, in the address bar, everything I see here is URLs. Right, so uh, let's look a bit more closely at, uh, at URLs. Uh, one sec, let me just uh, pause a bit. Right, um, so we're talking about the, the structure of URLs. Uh, so first of all, they can contain a limited set of characters, right? So they can contain the characters of the English language, digits from 0 to 9, and a bunch of, uh, so dashing, underscore, tilde. Now, obviously, this, this brings me to one first problem, which is uh, that, like I said, there's a remote perspective, the URL, and a local perspective, the path. And the way that files could be named in the host operating system where the server runs might be different. You know, it, it might have a different set of characters, which are valid. So I can use additional ASCII characters via something which is called percent encoding. Uh, so for example, spaces would become percent 20. That's because percent encoding works like this. So I have the marker, which is the percent. And then I have the ASCII code of the character in hexa. So in this case, the, uh, the, the number of the, the code of, of space is 32, and writing it in hexa is 20. I can also, because this evolved in time, I can also uh, percent encode Unicode characters. Uh, there's a proposed extension of the standard uh, for full Unicode support. Now, if I think about uh, a website which is addressed to, say, British people, it's all fine, right? It's, it's all my characters. If I think of a website which is addressed to Romanian people, I might be able to adapt by not using the special characters, not no tsu, no shu, no nothing like that, uh, because it's, it's close enough. But if I think about a website which is addressed to Chinese people, they need a whole different set of characters, right? And there's, there's a proposed extension for this. Uh, as, a, as an anecdote, uh, when the internet became popular in China, uh, you know, it first became popular, the most uh, requested domains were things which had repeatable numbers, right? because many Chinese people didn't actually, letters, you know, Latin alphabet letters had no significance, but numbers had the same significance everywhere, so you could have 808.cn. Right, so that's, that's the reason to, to extend this, uh, this set. Now, a URL actually can be used for something else, right? So for FTP, for JDBC, etc. We're not interested in that. We're interested just in HTTP and HTTPS. Now, I can make the distinction by using a different schema. Right? So this is going to define what the URL parts do. For HTTP and HTTPS, which I remind you are identical, right? except for something which is lower level, I'm going to have HTTP or HTTPS respectively um, in this place where the schema is. Now, uh, after this, so uh, after the schema, I'm going to have the server. Now, the server brings me to another interesting discussion because if I look at the server, this is docs.google.com. 
this is asset.ro this is Wiki and wikipedia org etc so these are easy to remember but they don't seem particularly computer friendly because what i want from this server is to allow me to take some information from one point in the network to another point in the network and for that these seem useless and indeed they are what's actually being used is something called ip addresses so internet protocol addresses and ip addresses do allow me to to route packets through the network so to take data from one point to the other but uh, they're really human unfriendly. So what's happening here is that they have a specific service called DNS, so domain name service. And DNS is going to answer one of two questions. Either I'm going to ask it, what is the IP address for this name? Or I'm going to ask it, what is the name for this IP address? Now the next part is a port. Uh, you've noticed that you never write the port. That's because, as long as I use the typical port, the default port, uh, the browser is going to compensate for me. I, I don't have to write anything. The typical HTTP port is 80, and the typical HTTPS port is 443. <coughs> <coughs> right, so what's the port for? Uh, well, I said that IP addresses allow me to, to take to take data from one part of the network to another part of the network. And let's say they, they get the, from the source computer to the destination computer. Once they get there though, on that computer I might have more than one application which has network traffic, which has network communication. So I'm not going to know who the data is for. So the way to identify a particular application is this port. This is a number uh, which is going to be reserved by a particular application. So I, when I have an application which wants to communicate over the network, it's going to do something called port binding. So it's just going to reserve a particular point, a particular port. And obviously, I can only have one application at one time over a specific port. Right, so that's the port. Now, if I just get this, I'm going to, to get... Uh, index HTML from the web root, so the directory from where the server delivers static resources. But obviously that directory might also have some structure, right? So I might have subdirectories and sub subdirectories until I get to my resource. Uh, so I'm going to have the path to the resource and the name of the resource. Now I notice however that I have a bunch of other things after the resource name. Why would I have those? So let's say I have a path which uh, tells the server to deliver to me a list of kittens. Right, so I have the list of kittens. Now what if I want the list of kittens sorted? Is that a different resource? Well, not really, no. It's, a, it's the same resource in a different representation. So uh, this is what these query parameters are for. Right, so I'm going to say a question mark, params, and I'm going to have a list of parameters. In this case, I'd have something like uh, sort by equals name and sort order equals one. Uh, we're going to see the param list shortly. And the last part is a fragment. Now, what fragments were initially, they were the equivalent of bookmarks. Right? So if I have a really large book, I might want bookmarks. Now, I don't know if they've ever been used on a large scale for this, but they're really useful for us. Because if you think about it, our application is a really large page, right? because it's a single page. And I might need to address a particular state in the application. Let's say I, I advertise on Google, and I want to have a link which takes me to the registration form in my app. How do I do that? Right? Since this is a single page, it's going to be a single resource from the perspective of the browser. So I'm going to use fragments to be able to address that particular form. Now, as for the query parameter list, let's go back to this. It looks something like this. Right? So it's a, it's a bunch of key value pairs separated by ampersand. Now, uh, interestingly enough, we also have a problem here, which is what happens if instead of my name being just Andre, I would have said Andre Toma. I would have had a space, and the space wouldn't have been valid. Right? It's, it's not valid in a, in a URL. So this sort of parameter list can also be encoded. It's encoded via a specific method which is called URL encoding. 
Obviously, it's not like I'm going to do this encoding by hand, but I'm going to have to take this into account and use the appropriate library to encode things. <clears throat> now, if we look at an HTTP request again, and let's look at this one because it's the simplest. I see that I have a method which requests a resource. We've seen the resource, so let's look at the method. As an aside, in the browser, I can actually say view source and see how the request was actually sent sent over the wire. Right, so this is this is what I actually sent, and this is what the server replied with. <coughs> right. So let's uh, let's get back to this. So so the request uh, the request the request looks like this. So I have one request line specifying the method and the resource I am uh, requesting. Then I have a number of headers. And like I said, headers are a bunch of key value pairs, which allow me to configure the way communication is done. Then I have an empty line and then an optional request body. Now why optional? Well, we'll get back to this talking about the, the methods themselves themselves. So I say I have a method and the resource address. So my methods are going to be, for example, options. Now, if I do options to a particular resource, what I'm going to get, the default is that that resource responds uh, that I can do get to that resource and I'm going to get the resource. Now, if I do get, think about it. What would I send in the request body? Well, nothing. There's nothing to send to the server, right? It's a, the request body is going to be empty. I'm, I'm expecting the server to send me the resource in response. What else can I do to a particular resource? Well, I can post that resource. So the post, uh, the post method, asks the server to add the sub resource at the specified location. So this is the equivalent of creating something, right? It's a if I think in terms of uh, if I think in terms of of CRUD applications, right? So create, read, update, delete. Uh, this is create. Now, the next method is put. This is update, but it's a special kind of update, although we're going to generally be used, use it uh, as a regular update. So put is a an update by replacement, right? So I'm going to send a new version of the resource and the server is supposed to replace the existing resource with the one I sent. Now, if I want something which is, let's say, more intuitive in terms of how, how we think about updates, I can use patch, which is just modify an existing resource. And uh, another method is delete, in which I ask the server to delete a particular, uh, a particular resource. Now, if when I did get, I didn't send something in the resource, in the request body, when I do delete, I might not receive anything in the response body. Right? Because there's nothing the server can send to me. Uh, what I'm interested in response to delete is if it happened or not. And if it happened, it's all fine. Now there's a bunch of other methods which are of, uh, of limited interest to us. Uh, head, for example, uh, is a, the equivalent of a get in which I don't receive the resource, but only the headers. Let's imagine the case where... I, what I actually do is I want to, to request a resource which is really large. I have, I have a, a huge resource. <coughs> and before I commit to doing this, what I want to do is see if the server supports compression. And if it doesn't, I'm going to decide not to request the resource. So I can do a head request, see if, if the server supports compression, and then redo a get request to actually get the resource itself. Now, in response to my request, the server is going to give me an HTTP response. Right? The HTTP response is, uh, contains a response line containing the response code and the human readable justification, a number of response headers, an empty line, and then the uh, response body. And if I look here, uh, the response looked like this. Right. So I have the version of the protocol, which I've ignored, but I have a code and an explanation, a bunch of headers, and maybe something in the response. I can see that here I have nothing in the response. We'll see soonish why. But this is the, the general gist of it. Now the codes, the 
codes are these. And notice that I've written them as one whatever, right? So it's it's three numbers and it's one something, two something, three something, etc. The reason why I said one whatever there is that the class, right, the first uh, the first uh, digit is really important, but the rest is not. The rest I can decide to use as I see fit. And to illustrate this, let's look at this list of HTTP status codes and look at this particular error. Right. It's 418, I'm a teapot. So I can use them for whatever. But the class is important because the class is a convention. If, uh, if, I, if I use an API, which you know, uh, does HTTP requests for me, it's going to assume that, for example, 400 something is an error. I can't use 400 something for success. Right, so what are these classes? So 1x uh, is uh, informative. It's just information, it's status information and the like. 2 something is success. Now success means that the operation was successful. It might be 200 OK, it might be 201 created, etc. I can have success without having a resource sent by the server. If I think about a delete, I'm probably going to get a 202 accepted and nothing in the re response body. Of course, I can think about some side cases where I'd want to send something for delete, but generally I'm not going to get anything. Now, 300 something redirect. Now, this is interesting. It's, uh, it's the server telling me, I don't have the resource, but I know where you can find it. And we're going to, to talk about two examples, two, two, two things about this. So, uh, the first uh, thing which, which is interesting, and we're going to look at this, we see that this is a 300 response. And this is a redirect to self. Now, transmitting things over the network is expensive. Right? It's, it's something which takes time and takes resources. So I'd like to not send uh, anything useless over the network. So the first, uh, the first thing which I might do in this direction is to have a caching mechanism. So when I request a resource, I can save it locally in case that in the future I need it again and it has not changed. Now I notice that the server answers with the resource, maybe, in this case it redirects, and with something called the E tag. It can be an E tag or it can be something else. Let's look at this one. Let's look at, for example, this is an image. It, must, it might not uh, modify that frequently. So the server sent an E tag and it also sent something which is last modified. Now, if I request this image again, I'm going to send either the e tag or if modif another header which says if modified sense. And uh, the server, depending on uh, if the resource has been modified or not, it's either go is either going to send me the new version of the resource with the new e tag, or it's just going to tell me, like it did here, that there's no need for it, that I have it. <clears throat> so this is one use case for, for 300 codes. Now the second use was that's this is let's say a, a side case, but the another typical use case for 300 codes. Let's say somebody has a blog, and they advertise something. I don't know sunglasses, and I read something in the blog. I'm really enthusiastic, and I'm going to click the link to buy the sunglasses. Now the person having the blog wasn't shilling for nothing, right? They they wanted to be paid for it, and the question becomes. Uh, how can the uh, the shop selling these sunglasses know who the client came from? And the answer is that when I click the link for the sunglasses, it's not actually going to get me to the sunglasses. It's going to give me get me to an intermediary step, which is going to register where I came from, and then that step is going to redirect me to the actual sunglasses so I can buy them. So that's typical, uh, the typical flow of, of redirects. Now, the, the next thing is client-side errors. <clears throat> now, I can see that I have client-side errors and server-side errors. The difference between these two is that I can, the assumption for client-side errors is that I could actually correct what I did wrong, make the, perform the request again, and I would get the resource. And it's possible to get the resource. For example, when I wander the internet and I run into a 404, right? When I run into a 404, 
what's going to happen is the server is going to tell me that maybe I made a typo in the URL. Right? The resource doesn't exist, but maybe it was just a typo, and I can correct the typo and request the resource again, and I'm going to, to get the resource. Uh, conversely, uh, if I do a, <coughs> a 401, if I get a 401, 401 is going to tell me I'm unauthor unauthorized. So maybe I missed a header. Right? I needed a header to, to, ch to attest that I'm authorized. And if I don't have the header, maybe I could correct that. Maybe I could add the header. Or if I get a 400, a malformed request. Maybe I forgot to do something about my parameters. Right, so 400 errors are errors which could be corrected on the client side. 500 errors are errors which cannot be corrected on the client side, which means uh, the only thing I can do as a client is to wait. Right, If the server can't connect to the database, there's nothing I can do. That's it. Right, uh, so these are my, my response codes. Right, that I can see response codes of OK or OK. Now, something to note is that by its very nature, the web is transparent. I can uh, look at any page. I, this is not something I have access to directly in any shape or form, right? So I can look what happened uh, at any moment and uh, and see how what was transmitted over the network etc radio so uh, we're going to stop with http for now and we're going to uh, to go through to an intro in javascript we're going to discuss a, a bunch of http things uh, when we need them such as uh, what the restful service idea was about um, i i need one minute I'll, I'll be right back if you have any questions i'll answer them immediately after right so let's talk a bit about javascript we're not going to get uh, all that far because we are not going to have that much time um, but JavaScript is going to be the language you're going to use uh, for both for the client side and the server side. And it has some interesting aspects uh, to itself. Um, we're going to first talk in principle and then we're going to see some examples and explain some of these aspects. So first things first, uh, JavaScript is a, what is called a multi-paradigm language. Right? So it's, uh, it has various models in which you can write things. Which means uh, I can represent the same idea in various ways. This list is actually incomplete if you if you go into the details because I can I can write in, in, in a bunch of different ways in JavaScript, but I have uh, JavaScript as an imperative language, as a functional language, as an and as an object-oriented language. Now, as a note, as a functional language, uh, JavaScript is a lot closer to a fully functional language than something like Java, which contains uh, some arrow functions and so forth. Right, so it's a, it has a really powerful functional core. Uh, now, as an object-oriented language, JavaScript is a bit alien. It's the only mainstream language which uses a different object representation model from everybody else. Everybody else has what is called the classic model, while uh, JavaScript has a prototypical model. We're not going to get to that today, obviously, because uh, that would be too much, but we're, uh, we'll get to that, uh, it eventually. Now, JavaScript is an interpreted language, so I don't need any compilation step. Right, it's a, I can just run the source through the interpreter, and everything is going to to work fine. Uh, now, where is that interpreter? Well, it's in uh, it's in, in two places. So uh, and this is, is something interesting for JavaScript. If I if I open the developer tools, I notice that they have a uh, a console here. Right. And the console is going to be JavaScript console, a JavaScript interpreter, which is included in the browser. In this case, it's called Chrome V8, and it's the most popular one. So JavaScript can run in the browser, which is the, the way it, it started out. But it can also run in a command line. So let's, let's go to the command line. One sec, let me just create a different directory for this particular course. And let's let's create the the simplest JavaScript uh, thing. It's, we're gonna call it one.js, and we're gonna say console log hello world. 
Right, and we can just run this. And it says hello world. Now, a couple of things to note. <coughs> uh, the code might look strange. Because uh, I, I noticed something, which is, uh, so console seems to be an object, which seems to have a method, which seems to receive a string as a parameter. That's all fine. But where did console come from? Well, there's something in JavaScript, which is called a global object. So this was an object which was created by the interpreter. Uh, so it's not the only one, and it was created by the interpreter. So that's a bit strange. Now something else, I said the language isn't compiled. It isn't, I, did, I didn't have to compile this file. That doesn't mean there's no in-memory compilation. So there's an optimization step, which is a just-in-time compilation, which optimizes the code in memory. But it's transparent to me. Now, what happens if I take this bit and throw it into the browser? Well, it's sort of going to work, but something strange happened. So, first things first, I noticed that console exists here. Second thing is that it's written hello world, but it also it's also written undefined. That's because if I'm in the console, in the interpreter itself, whatever I write is interpreted, it's, it's evaluated. And in this case, console log hello world doesn't return anything. And if it doesn't return anything, it seems that JavaScript said it was undefined. Now, since I have console here, but also here, I have to wonder, what's the difference, right? Is there a difference between JavaScript on the server and JavaScript on the client? <coughs> well, with a particular caveat, the, the language itself is identical, right? So, uh, all the control structures which I have in the browser, I have on the server. Or if I run JavaScript on a little robot, I'm going to have them there too. Uh, all the data types are the same and so forth. Uh, the caveat I was uh, talking about is the fact that uh, JavaScript has something which is called a living standard, which, which means that the standard is continuously, continuously updated. And because uh, implementation of a standard takes some time, I might find myself in the situation where something is in the standard but is not available in Node, for example. It's not been yet been implemented, but the intent is for the language to be the same everywhere. Uh, this is something we're most likely not going to run into that frequently. So, uh, so the language is the same. So what's different? Well, what's different is the context in which I'm executing things. And this determines a couple of things. So if I think about running JavaScript in the browser, this is uh, some code which I've received from the internet, which I'm running on my local computer. computer. This means, necessarily, this code has to be sandboxed. If it's not sandboxed, I'm vulnerable to a myriad of attacks, right? So, for example, this code can't possibly write a file on my local computer. It can't know the characteristic of the characteristics of the browser process and so forth. Right, so it's sandboxed, so it doesn't have access to anything else. What it does have access to is objects like window, because uh, I know for sure I'm in a context in which I can draw things. Right? So I have window, I have document, etc. Right? It's, this is what a, a browser does. On the other hand, if I go to the, the console variant, the, the server variant of the JavaScript, I can see I have console, but I'm not going to have window or document. I might write some code which at some point would initialize a variable called window, but I'm not going to have it by default. I am, however, going to have a global object called process. And I am going to have access to uh, APIs called file system, right? Uh, or OS, because this is something which doesn't have to be sandboxed. It's going to do exactly what I tell it to do. It's, not, uh, it's, it's my code running on my computer. It's not somebody else's code running on my computer. Right, uh, so this is the difference between the server-side and, uh, and client-side JavaScript. Now, what about this thing? You know, dynamic, type, determinable, and modifiable at runtime. Well, let's look for a couple of examples. Let's create a new one. Let's leave hello world as it is and say 2.js. And let's say let a equals 5. 
and we're going to write A and then we're going to write type of A which is an operator which tells me the type right so it says 5 and number <coughs> now this doesn't necessarily tell me that my language is dynamically typed I have a lot of statically typed languages where this makes sense because even if I didn't specify the type for A I can determine it by what I first put into it which is a number whatever number is okay but this is going to prove that this is dynamically typed because I'm going to say A equals some string and run it and see that I could modify A not just in terms of value but also in terms of type what was a number here became a string here right so what about these numbers string what are these well these leads us to this leads us to types uh, because JavaScript has a, a limited number of types which are included in the language so let's see uh, it has some some simple types and some complex types uh, we're going to simplify this uh, for now but the simple types are going to be number string and boolean and the complex types are going to be array and object now uh, there is the concept of a purely object-oriented language a purely object-oriented language is a language in which everything is an object now JavaScript isn't that uh, what I'm actually seeing here are primitives right? so I have a primitive number a primitive string and a primitive boolean and so forth uh, however it works really hard to pretend it's a purely object-oriented language which means that for example if I were to take a <coughs> and call a method on it uh, to uppercase now obviously on a primitive type I wouldn't have to uppercase but what happened here is that Java what happens here is that JavaScript is going to do auto boxing so whenever I take a primitive type and behave as if it were an object type it's going to be wrapped in the corresponding object type and then I'm going to have the method right, so this works so in most cases these primitives are going to behave just like objects what's interesting in JavaScript is a bunch of things I wouldn't imagine as being objects actually are so for example functions are objects right uh, let's see something else before we proceed though so we've uh, we've seen that we have a number type and a string type now another question appears what's a number type right because if I look at other languages I'm not I'm not generally going to have something which is called number what would the number be right what I have is a specific kind of number right I have a an int a float a double etc now uh, in JavaScript I have this number type because the only thing that I have is floating point numbers in double representation right so it's they're all floats they're all floating point I can pretend they're ints but they're actually floating point numbers uh, this has a this has a an interesting consequence in the sense that uh, operations between floating point numbers are fundamentally imprecise which means everything is a, approximate uh, which means I'm, I would have to have uh, to do something special to actually have I don't know a counting software written in JavaScript right uh, before we proceed let's uh, let's look at something else though let's look at this thing what is the variable declaration let's see what if instead of saying let a equals 5 we just say let a what would a be well we had a hint of this earlier when we wrote the console log in the console of the browser and it's undefined now undefined first of all it functions as a special type with a single value right so if I do type of a it's going to be still undefined now what is undefined because this is uh, an important concept 
Now, if I think about something being not being determined in a language like Java or C Sharp, uh, what I'm going to have is, let's say we have a language which is purely object-oriented. In a purely object-oriented language, which is statically typed, when I have something which is not determined, it's going to be null. But what null means is I know the type of something, but I don't know the value of something. Well, in JavaScript, since it's dynamically typed, I have a, another degree of non-determination, in the sense that I, need, I know neither the type nor the value of something. Right, and that's undefined. So null represents I know the type but not the value, and undefined represents I, ne I know neither the type nor the value. But another interesting question appears. Let's let's do something else. Let's say console log b. And now something strange is going to happen, which is going to give us an error which says b is not defined. Well, how is not defined different from undefined? Well, it is actually because I have to wonder if I do let a, what does this do? Right? How is the situation different after I do let a from before I do let a? Well, um, the situation is different because I can look at this from the perspective of having, having a hash map or a, something similar. And I can think of the, the namespace in which I declare my variables as a hash map. Now, this hash map is going to contain a bunch of keys. Now, if I access a key which doesn't contain anything, it would be intuitive that I get something which is similar to undefined. But if I access a key which doesn't exist, what I should get is a key error. And this is what happened here. B was not defined in the sense that the key didn't exist. That name, B, had no significance. Whilst A existed as a name, but it just didn't contain anything. Right, so that's, uh, that's undefined. <clears throat> Right, so let's let's continue a bit. Let's uh, first of all, let's see something else. Let's uh, if we learn in the traditional fashion, we try to learn a language. We're going to talk about types and also operators. Now, once the types are a bit special, the operators are going to be what I'd expect to find in a C-inspired language. Right, they're the same operators, and you can look at them at your own leisure. I can give you a link or. But if you look for JavaScript operation, operators, you're going to find them. There are just a few operators which I don't have in C. But some of them are C-like. right? It's, uh, so, for example, I don't have this in C. I don't, but I, I could easily imagine this operator in C without any significant problems. right? It's, this is an exponentiation uh, operator. It's 3 to the second power. Let's say 3 to the third power, uh, no, 3 to the third power is 27 and so forth. Even if it doesn't exist, there's nothing special about this. But let's look at something which is special, which again is something about the nature of the language. So let's say we have S, which is the string 5, and we have N, which is the number 5. Now, uh, I said that the third. Um, primitive type, or the first simple type uh, in JavaScript, is Boolean. Right? And Boolean is going to have two values, just as everywhere else, which are true and false. And its characteristic is that I'm going to have expressions which evaluate to either true or false. Right? So if I wonder uh, something like uh, uh, 6 is greater than 5, I have 5, this should write true. Right? And indeed it does. So it, it, it seems to be working exactly like, uh, like in other languages. Now, what happens? Because like I said, there's a special pair of operators, let's call it. There's a, a special behavior in JavaScript. So if I, uh, if I wonder something like console log uh, n uh, is uh, greater than 3, again, this is going to work just as expected. True, true. But what if I wonder this thing, if n is equal to s? Now, uh, let's first get through the surprising part, which is it's true. And then let's try to understand why it's true, because this is a lot more relevant. Now, first of all, 
if I did this in many other languages, it wouldn't be a, the discussion wouldn't be about if they're equal, but it would be about if they're comparable, right? I'd probably get an error. Uh, so let's uh, let's introduce another operator which is specific to JavaScript, which does more of what we'd expect, which is this triple equal operator. Now this is going to be false. Now what's the difference between line eight and line ten? Well, line 8 could be read as n equals s, where n and uh, where the equals is in this particular JavaScript uh, perspective. Whilst 10 could be read as n equals and has the same type as s. This still leaves us with the question of how n and s are, can be equal. In, in what sense are, are they equal? Well, JavaScript is really uh, enthusiastic about implicit conversions. So if it tries to compare n with s, it can't. They're not comparable. But n and s are primitive types. So what I might try to do, what the language might try to do, is to compare their object representation. So is this number object equal to this string object? Not really, no. Right, so this has, these are still not comparable. Right, so what might I do now? Well, all objects have a toString method. So is the string representation of the number object equal to the string representation of the string object? Yes. And this is how they're equal. Whereas here, they're not equal. Because they don't have the same type. Which means uh, that unless I have a specific plan in my own code, I should prefer this one, the triple equals. Because it's a lot more intuitive. Right, so I have these, these implicit conversions. Now, what about explicit conversions? Right? Uh, if I do an explicit conversion, how would that look like? So let's see something else which is interesting. So let's have uh, let x is 7.5. So I can now write console log parse float of x. And this is going to give me a float. That's awesome. Now, I might have glimpsed that I can write something else, which is parse int of x. Now, this is strange because I said that there are no ends. Right? So, well, how is this an end? Well, the answer is it's not. It's a float. It's just that the fractional part was discarded. Right? So, it's, it's the same. It's still floating. Okay, so, um, so the language is lying. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> okay, but what happens if I do parse int or parse float of something which isn't quite a, an int or a float? Let's say uh, fake number. What's the result going to be? Well, it's going to be something which is called not a number. And not a number is a special numerical value which has the following characteristic. It propagates. Right, so there is nothing I can do to not a number to get anything else than not a number. So if I add something to it, there's nothing I can add uh, so that the result is not not a number. Uh, I can't multiply it with anything. Whatever I do to it, I'm going to get not a number. Right, so it propagates a numerical error. Now this leads us to our booleans, which we've sort of seen. Now there's something, again, there's something specific to JavaScript here in the sense that booleans uh, have the value true and false, of course. But, uh, of course, if I do a, a comparison operator, for example, it evaluates to a Boolean, just like in other languages. But there's something else here, which is anything evaluates to a Boolean. Anything at all. Right, so now I have the concept of truthy and falsy values. So truthy values are things which evaluate to Boolean true. Falsy values are things which evaluate to Boolean false. Or more precisely, Truthy values are whatever is not falsy, and falsy values are a limited list of values. So let's see them. And they're these. Right, so the empty string is a falsy value. Zero is false. Now, there's actually two zeros because we're in floating point land. So it's zero plus zero and, and minus zero. Not a number is also false. False is false, obviously. Null 
it's like I uh, like I said, let me remind you, is something to which I know the type, which is object, and I don't know the value. It's not a valid reference. And undefined, which means something to which I know the both uh, I don't know both the type and the value. So these are my falsy values, and everything else is truthy. Now this this sort of makes some sense in the sense that if I think about an empty array, an empty array is truthy. Well, the reason why an empty array is truthy is that an array is represented also as an object, which means that's an actual object which has a length. Coincidentally, the length is zero, but it's a valid object. Right, so it's the value is truthy. Okay, one sec. Now let's uh, let's talk uh, a bit. Uh, of course, we're going to continue with this in a uh, one sec. I think I have a question. One sec. Let me just pause this. Right. So starting the recording again. Let's just uh, briefly look at objects and arrays. Uh, like I said, we're not going to finish with these. So uh, first things first. Uh, arrays. Now arrays are, are actually have an objectual representation, and I can uh, write something. Let me just check. One sec. Yes. And I can write something like this: that a is new array, etc. But I generally don't want to do that. What I want to do is to use this array literal syntax. And my arrays are actually a bunch of things. Uh, so this comes from the beginning of JavaScript, where a lot of concepts are overloaded. Which means that my array functions as a list. It's actually an array list. Let, you know. right, it, it functions like this. Uh, five. No, six. Right, I can actually, because it's JavaScript, and JavaScript doesn't do errors generally, but rather, if I try this in Java, it would be an array index out of bounds. But in JavaScript, it's just going to tell me undefined. But my array actually also functions as a queue and a stack. Now, to have a stack as a structure, what I need to have is a list of things for which inserting and removing are done at the same uh, at the same end so i can do console i'm uh, gonna do a dot push six and console log a dot pop and let's write the array before and after Right, so it pushes something to the end. It works like a stack, which is on one side. Conversely, I can do something else. I can do a dot unshift minus one, let's say, and the reverse of unshift is shift. Right, so that works. Now, if I can insert and delete things at one end of a list and at the other end, if I combine them, right, if I use, for example, unshift and pop, uh, it's going to give me a queue, right, which is either in one direction or in the other direction. So the arrays work like queues as well. And for the last thing we want to see, we want to look at objects for a bit, and then I will take some final questions and we'll end. Uh, and objects look uh, even more interesting. Let's say let O, and an empty object is going to be this. And let's say I want to for it, I want to it contain something, be some string. And I'm telling you this is an object, and this is a, a strange assertion, right? It's a it doesn't look like an object. What it looks like is a hash map. So how is this an object? Well, let's think about it for a bit. Sorry, I'm going to take a couple more minutes of your time, so I finish with you. Uh, let's think about it for a bit. What is an object? Right? An object is a way, if I think about the goal I'm, I'm doing, it's a way of, of, of grouping state and behavior. Right? Uh, 
method, so of grouping attributes and methods, basically. So uh, for this to, to function as an object, because for now I just have attributes, what I, so for, to have a hash map which functions as an object, what I need to have is functions as values. And this actually brings us back to, to what we said earlier, that JavaScript has a strong functional core. So let's have a function, the simplest one possible. Now this shouldn't look that alien, because if I think about JavaScript as a, uh, as a, let's say I'm a little function. If I think of, uh, of JavaScript as a dynamically typed language, this makes sense, right? Because I need to mark the beginning of a function with a, with a keyword, whatever it is, whether it's def or function or whatever. Because otherwise, I'd have ambiguity between the declaration and the invocation of a function. No, I don't. Everything's fine. This function has no parameters, nothing complicated. But in JavaScript, like I said, functions are, uh, are values. So I can do let f1 equals f. And then call f1. Now this is, uh, this is not necessarily what it seems. This is not a reference to the function, it's something else. But we're going to explore this in more detail in a future episode. But this is, this is something else, it's a function as value. And I can see I can put it somewhere. But what if I put it in the object? Uh, let's call it do stuff. And then call o.do stuff. Right, so that worked. Now there's one question remaining here, and we're not going to answer it today, which is, is this a function which works on the object, or is it a method? What would the difference between a function and a method uh, be? Well, a method actually knows who this is. Right? It, it knows what object it's on. We'll get back to this in a, in a future thing. For now, let's, uh, let's end our recording and uh, see if you have any questions until now. I'll, I'll try to clarify with the questions if need be.